now on the score, it's time for a very special guest and it's a real privilege to have him on the programme this week. A Northern Ireland legend who's back in the Irish League with Dungan and Swift's Roy Carroll. Thank you for doing this. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me on. Great to be on. Cheers. When you left Linfield, I don't know if any of us ever expected you coming back to the Irish League, but we've somehow dragged you back into it with Dungan and Swift's. Yeah, it was a situation when I done my knee. I just thought, like, I've opened my goalkeeping school uh, in 2019, August 2019, and that was going really well. I was trying to look after the young keepers in Northern Ireland, uh, trying to uh, uh, develop them as much as I could. But uh, things happen in life, and this pandemic came along and stopped everything with the goalkeeping schools and stuff. And uh, I still do quite a lot of Zoom chats with the kids and try and keep them active. But uh, for myself, I, I had a need to do something and uh, the only other option I could do was come back and play football. And I had that opportunity, thankfully, thankfully with Dungannon and appreciate everything Dungannon's done for me to, to get me back in the Irish League. Was this something that was rumbling on for a while or did it happen quite quickly? I think it happened there uh, that the, this lockdown. It was the situation was uh, we thought we'd be back uh, back out coaching and enjoying uh, the coaching with the young ke- keepers uh, with my RC one coaching. But uh, the the situation changed in the middle of uh, January. I think it was probably the end of January uh, when uh, they turned around and said we're going to be uh, locked down again until uh, the fifth of March. So it was very difficult for me to uh, to take that like because I was really looking forward and I know all the kids uh, out there who are coming to RC1 coaching is the same thing same boat they have nothing to look forward to at the weekend or during the week uh, to get out and being coached or getting out and playing football so uh, I was I was lucky one that I got the opportunity to go out and play football but there's a lot of people uh, below the Irish League uh, who, who are not playing football or playing any sports uh, people below elite sport is not doing nothing and to get keep the minds in the right, uh, right way. For me, uh, uh, to go to Dungallon was to come back and try and play, but was to help the, the, the two young keepers at Dungallon as well, which uh, I spoke to the manager about, and uh, I was looking forward to it as well. And they're two very good keepers. What have your early thoughts been of them? Yeah, I know Connor, young Connor for quite a while. Um, Sam, uh, I played against him at odds when I, went, I played for Linfield. Uh, very, very good keeper. Uh, uh, just hopefully I can come in and, and, and give them a bit of knowledge of, uh, they can watch me a bit of knowledge what I've went through in my career and uh, uh, hopefully it will rub off with them like because uh, it's just it's, I can't play forever and these young keepers is the next future of uh, football in Northern Ireland They are what a, an amazing opportunity for them you know because <laughs> you don't expect to be able to work with a former Northern Ireland international a former Manchester United player necessarily when you're when you're having a very good Irish league career that to have that given to them at this stage must be uh, amazing. I'm sure they were both like kids at Christmas, but trying to not let you see that. <laughs> <laughs> Kimmy, uh, it's probably the same as me when uh, my my uh, hero, Pat Jennings, came in as a goalkeeping coach at Northern Ireland. I've done this quite a few times, talking about uh, when I was in Northern Ireland, Pat Jennings came in as a goalkeeping coach. And I just stood there and I was just over the moon to see my hero standing in front of me. Uh, taking shots against me, but I don't think I'm not that, that big a hero for the, uh, the young keepers, but the, I try and help them as much as I can and, and hopefully you can take little bits from me and, and help them in the future because, uh, as I said to them all, I've had a lot of co- goalkeeping coaches in my career. Uh, I take little bits from all of them and uh, uh, see if it can come into my game. Uh, every, every goalkeeper is different, so uh, as long as they, they, they can take something from me or something from any goalkeeping coach uh, that have helped them for the future, that's... That's all I want. I want them to succeed and, and give them a little help, uh, help uh, along the way. That's all I would like them to do. I know as a goalkeeper, you have to be very mentally tough and, and certainly when you're in pressure environments. Did that help you when you were thinking about pulling the gloves back on in the Irish Premiership? Because you hadn't played in a little while and you know what it's like when you're a well-known face and name. People like to write about you. Oh, Kimia, it's uh, I've been I've been out over two years now with this uh, with the with the injury knee injury, and uh, I, I said uh, I don't know I've done a lot of press since uh, I signed the contract with uh, Dungannon, and uh, I had butterflies on uh, Tuesday night going up to Balamina, and uh, I think that's good to have. I think it's good for anybody to have, no matter what league you play in. Uh, even at FC Minewell, when I was playing for FC Minewell. A uh, great bunch of people there, what they're trying to do with the club. But uh, even in uh, the third division in Mid-Ulster, uh, I always have them little butterflies. And 
and it's the good to have them little things to keep you going through the through life and especially playing football i enjoy it and it's in my blood and uh um i'm not getting as i said i'm not getting any younger and uh my next thing is probably take the coaching up really serious and i want to try and succeed as a coach as well always helps to have a winning debut and uh to make a worldy of a save that was that was nice to see roy yeah, it was uh, it was nice to keep a clean sheet uh, going up there, and uh, the boys the boys were ready for it, and we worked really hard. And uh, the, the young lads at Dungannon they, they gave everything. I only had two saves to make, and and that, that's the, that's how great the, the players did in front of me. It's the work rate. You have to win the battle before you can win the war, and that's uh, and that's what I always say. And Dungannon did that on Tuesday night, and it was nice to keep uh, keep. Uh, but everybody's going on about the uh, the sec the save I didn't in the last ten minutes, but. My favourite save was the one-on-one save because that's the one when you when you're playing against the player who's coming in. You're playing mind games and you just stand up as long as you can and and let let him make a decision. But uh, the one I saved in the, the last ten minutes, it was just a reaction save and I got down got down uh, and saved it. And lucky enough, it stayed out. When you made that save, you sort of jumped back up straight away. What was going on in your head there? Is that just a reflex, or were you about to tell somebody off? <laughs> no, uh, it was uh, the ground was soaking and I didn't want to get wet. <laughs> It was uh, the six yard box. It was like a swamp. It was uh, really, really bad. Like and uh, a lot of rain, uh, a lot of rain in Ballymena that night, and uh, the pitch was very soggy. And uh, <laughs> it was just getting up very quick. Love that. It's just a, it's it's just the reaction you do in training. Uh, you make a save. You don't hold on to it. You get up quick. It's just normal. It comes it comes natural. It's uh, get up quick as as fast as you can, and uh, and see what happens from there because you might have to make a second save. Really interesting hearing you talk about those one-on-one moments because there was a moment in uh, the title winning season with Linfield when Crusaders were miles in front and you did that amazing comeback and went on to win. And there was a game at Windsor Park where I think it was Paul Heatley was one-on-one and you make a save with your legs. And I said, is that the moment that the, the title race changes? And, it, you know, it maybe proved to be that, but it does show you the importance of, of getting those things right as a goalkeeper because it might be a month or two before the final day of the season, but everything can change on a result or on a decision. It does. Uh, that's why I keep saying to the keepers, it's, it's, it's OK making loads of saves, like, but the one what you should see if it goes in, I think it's, uh, it's important, uh, especially when you're playing for a team like Linfield, uh, you might not have that much to do in a game and you come on and, uh, uh, like, that one-on-one, uh, Haley came in through great player. Uh, came in. Uh, uh, I just stood my ground as long as I could. And uh, the thing with that, goalkeepers have to understand that uh, the, the strikers are under pressure because the defenders are coming back. If you stand up as long as you can to butt him off, he has a decision to make. Uh, does he hit it first time or does he try and take it around you? And uh, for me, lucky enough, he uh, he hit it to my left. I can still remember it. Uh, he hits to my left side, and I just took my leg out and. Big size eleven saved the shot like with my foot. Have you always been like that, having those moments kind of just ingrained in your mind? I think I think when you get older, uh, when I went to Greece, I learned quite a lot with the goalkeeping coach in Greece, and uh, my one-on-one uh, technique came on a lot better when I when I was in Greece. Uh, I, I was I was coached with one-on-one uh, a lot of one-on-one sessions because in Greece, it's, uh, you probably you probably do more one-on-ones than you do in any other league, but. Uh, for me, uh, um, it's, I think when you get older, you get more experience and you can learn and you learn about yourself. And, and uh, I'll tell you a wee story, Michael. Uh, I got a video sent through to me on Twitter from uh, a Hull City supporter. My first season in Hull City and my technique was all over the place. And I was embarrassed to watch it. But that's what I'm saying. It, it's, it's your technique and you work on these drills and training. And what you do in training, you bring it on to the match day. And, and it, stays in, it stays, you're playing against the player. People say you're playing, you wait for the ball to be strike. No, you're playing against the player. You know what I mean? Who you're playing against, the quality of the player. If he's quality, he'll try and take it around you. If it's not, he'll try and just smash, smash it straight down the middle. So uh, I've, I learned that when I got older and more experienced. Goalkeeping is something that everyone has an opinion on. Very few people have an understanding of. And even in the last, I don't know, 10 years, we've seen the evolution of what we expect or want from goalkeepers with keepers saving more with their feet, not having a wrong hand to save it with, all these sorts of things. Um, what's that been like as someone playing through it? Because I guess different coaches want different things of you like they would any other player. You have to, depends, uh, like me, I was always open-minded and I went to Greece and open-minded and I, this top hand, this new top hand thing, instead of going with your left hand, you go with your top hand 
And I, um, one day um, in a game, about six months after being at the Olympiagos, a, a ball came in and it was going uh, my left side and i done the top hand save. And it, it was really, um, it was one of those saves that I said, gee, that was comfortable. Uh, but when I was doing it in training, I didn't feel comfortable doing it. But there is some keepers that uh, you have to be very careful of uh, because if you are a coach and uh, you just come in and change the, the goalkeeper's uh, technique and attitude and everything all at once, it's going to be a big problem for the goalkeeper because he has too much things in his head. So when uh, the older the keeper are and experience the keeper they are, you, have to, you just have to try and help them as much as you can and give them a little bit of advice at a time. But when, that's why I love coaching young kids because they're, 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 they're just starting off and you give them, you give them the, the technique when they were young. And that's why I always say to the, the parents and the, the people over here is when they're young keepers, you have to get the technique right before you can push on anywhere else because it takes a lot. Like I, I was still learning at Linfield being a goalkeeper. You never stop learning as a goalkeeper. Parents, hopefully they understand now that uh, what I'm trying to do is like we can give them so much, but they have to learn themselves through their career. And what do you make about goalkeepers now, probably more than ever, having to play with their feet? You know, once upon a time, get it long, get it clear, job done maybe for, for the next phase of play. Whereas you've seen coaches like Guardiola want the almost a sweeper keeper. Yeah, because that changed because of the rules, you see. Uh, the ball used to come back and you can pick it up. Uh, th- things change, you see. The rules have changed. Now, the rules, like, you can take the goal kick and the, the defender can be in the uh, six-yard box, you know what I mean? So... The rules change these things, and uh, then the keepers have to use the feet more, and uh, that's that's the thing now. It's probably 70, 80 percent of uh, of uh, training sessions now are probably working with your ball at the feet, but you can still. Uh, people say you kick the hoof the ball up long, but no, you, you can do a good long pass. Uh, I watch Man City keeper, and the first thing he does, he looks up and see if there's any any opportunity to do a quick counter attack. If that's not all, he plays short. But you have to mix the game up, and you still. And these young keepers in Northern Ireland, you don't know what level they're going to end up playing at. So what do we teach them? Do we teach them to play in the Premier League? You teach them for all, all way of life as a, a goalkeeper? Because I played in every league in England. So every league was different. The lower you go, less, less playing out from the back. So you have to, you have to it's, it's a tough job uh, trying to help these young keepers. And, and, and just I want to try and give them the basic uh, idea as a goalkeeping coach and basic technique. And uh, that's the way forward for them. And then if they do go across the wall or go to Linfield or go to Clinton or whatever club they go to in the Irish League, because the Irish League, the Irish League is get, getting better every year. And uh, I would like to see more young Northern Ireland keepers uh, pushing in that uh, Irish League as well. What really struck me when you signed for Linfield was how commanding you are of your area, vocally as well as physically. I mean, you didn't need to strain to hear what Roy Carl was saying to the defence. Have you always had that in you or is that something you had to learn yourself as, as time went on? Gordy Lee from Balamalad, not too many people probably know him, but he was, uh, he was the chairman of Balamalad there uh, a few, about three years ago. And when I came back to play for Linfield against Balamalad, uh, he said, you haven't changed. I was 16 years old and I was vocal, but I was vocal by just shouting, keep myself, uh, but I didn't really know the game at the time at 16. So uh, and that, uh, when I came home and I was always vocal, uh, um, I just it's just me. Uh, but this day and age, just uh, goalkeeping, no disrespectful of them. Uh, they're very quiet. I don't know why that is. It's just the way life is now. You know what I mean? But I would like them to try and be more vocal and command the area and help the defenders. Uh, I don't watch the save. I don't watch the goals going in. I watch to see if the keeper can start, uh, talk to the defenders to see if they can help the defenders by stopping that ball from coming in the six-yard box or in the back of the net. Some of your old Linfield teammates said as well that, you know, you were a, almost like a referee within the camp too, that you, you wanted to keep that bar very high, the standards very high. And, you know, it didn't take David Healy to come in and tell people off necessarily. You were happy to do that sometimes. I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I didn't t- uh, have a tongue them off or whatever it was like a teacher. Like for me, it was the high standards to win leagues and win trophies is like, you have to do it every day of your life until you finish football. Uh, I learned that from Manchester United, from the best, you know what I mean? And, and the high standards is a big thing in life. And if you, don't, if you come in and say, oh, I'll do it tomorrow, uh, like you've lost a day, you've lost a training session. So everything you do in training, you bring on to the match day. Um, some of the boys, uh, you talk to them like uh, at the start, the punch is this guy's mad in the head. Like, but <laughs> come here, you win trophies, uh, you don't care what people's all about. It's all about getting that trophies and at the end of the season. And, and that's just me. And 
uh, David Healy's the same. He's uh, he's a winner and he wants to win things as a manager. And uh, and Linfield uh, Linfield won won quite a few trophies now since uh, since David Healy's took over and it's rubbing off on them uh, because Linfield Linfield was there. Uh, Winning everything with Big Davy Jeffers from uh, you know what I mean at Linfield and and they just went through a bad time and they got a manager and David Haley to come in and uh, change things around and it's worked. Yeah, and and you know David a lot better than I do, but he's a, a winner through and through, and he he absolutely hates anything but the best. And is that just something that if you've played at a certain level that that is in you? There's no taking it out. I think it is. I think he got that from when he was a young lad at United. You know what I mean? With all them players around him. Uh, like when I walked in at the, uh, the Carrington at the Manchester United training ground, first day, like we went out and played five a side. And it was like, gee, I just put my boots on, my gloves and thought, oh, have a wee nice, easy day. Come here. No. Uh, the training's intensity is very high. Every day you go on training. And the first year I, I, first year I was at Manchester United in the summer holidays, uh, I was completely shattered, not just body shattered, but I was mentally shattered as well. So you learn. And when I came back the second season, I was prepared in the right way to go again. And that's what the thing I say, like you learn every day you become a, you go on that pitch or training pitch, you learn every day you go on, uh, on that field and uh, you learn. And the next day you try and get better. And the next day you get better and better, try and keep getting better in your career. I was in the Millennium Stadium um, when you won the FA Cup, beat Millwall. I was probably the the loudest person cheering with what was it, five or six minutes to go. Substitution board goes yeah. up. Roy Carroll runs on. People are going, "What's this kid's story?" <laughs> yeah, no, that story was a good story. And so Alex, like, he kept his word, and that's why I respect the man. He 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 just he's truthful. You know what I mean? Sometimes you don't want to hear the truth. You know what I mean? But <laughs> uh, I think for me personally, uh, I I rather know the truth. I rather someone just be. Uh, straight to the point and telling me the truth and uh, you move on you know what I mean but uh, so Alex was uh, I knew rightly myself as a football, as a goalkeeper uh, we played Ars- we played at Aston Villa against um, the semi-finals against Arsenal and uh, I did really I did okay I made a couple I made a couple of saves and uh, then three or four games afterwards I was completely rubbish I knew I knew that myself and so Alex came up to me uh, I think it was coming up to me probably the last game of the, uh, of the season in the league, and he said, "Roy, um, I'm going to put Tim Howard in, uh, in uh, but that uh, I think it was Tim Howard, yeah, Tim Howard in." And I said, "I agreed, like, because I, I knew rightly my my I was I wasn't the best after the semi-finals, and uh, he said, "I will put you on at half time if we're winning two or three nil," and. Uh, I was sitting there, I think it was the last 10 minutes, and we scored, and it was 3-0, and he did put me on, which was fantastic. I keep saying I, I was going to let three goals in so I could have played extra time, but I didn't, I didn't want to do that in case I get in trouble. <laughs> clean, clean sheet in the middle, much better. <laughs> uh, much better, much better. But uh, it's some experience. You're, you're sitting in Ellis Gillen when you're 15, 14, and you, and you want to be a professional footballer, and then so many years uh, go ahead, like, and you end up uh, in the FA Cup lifting that trophy up, and and winning a few more trophies, it's it is a dream that comes through. It came through for me, and it was uh, it was a joy to play in them and all them games I played in my career. If you take yourself way back to you know those days in school, were people supporting you when you were saying like I I think I could do this, or did everyone look at you like you know that's a bit lofty, Roy? That's very few people make it. I uh, one of one of my career teachers said that because uh, it came in, not too many people came out of Fermanagh back in the early nineties, mid nineties, because not too many scouts came past Lisburn them days, and <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's the opportunity I got was because I was playing for Ballamallard and Dundella and Belfast. So if I if I never had that bit of luck with that guy, with uh, funny enough, it was uh, the ex Northern Ireland goalkeeper Alan Ferris, his brother Steve Ferris, who, yeah. who was playing against me. And he asked me to go for a trial over the whole city. So things happen. I always say things happen for a reason. And I was in the right place at the right time. So I had a bit of luck as well to get that opportunity. And uh, yes, of course, I've had many people saying you have the quality, but it's a big, big task to make it as a professional footballer. And when I signed that contract in 1996 as a professional contract, it was, I was over the moon. Yeah, there is something about when people go to Fermanagh, especially around Five Mile Town, they just get totally lost. I know, I don't know. Uh, every time I say I lived over the side of Five Town, everybody says Ocker Clock of what was it, Ocker Clock of Five Mile Town. They know that, like, but uh, give me Ellis Gillen. Uh, I, I love my county, I love the people in it, and that's why I've moved back home and uh, enjoy living down this part of the world. But uh, uh, it's just 
the kids down here, they have to push themselves and uh, hopefully the, the things that Balamalat are trying to do and the team, all the teams in Fermanagh Western, there is a lot of good young players down here that just need to get a chance and uh, get, the, get the opportunity to, to push themselves even further. Well, hopefully the world just gets back to normal soon and they can all get out and play again. I feel really sorry for, for kids that can't play football as much as we talk about you know the Championship and the Premier Intermediate League and, and rightly so. Just thinking of, of young boys and girls that can't get out and, and have a game of football. No, it's, it's all sports, I have to say, all the kids in all sports. I, I've, um, it's sad to say, like, but uh, I think there will be probably be the kids who just won't come back to sports after this because uh, if, if it happened to me, looking back, looking back in January there, when they came out on TV and said, we're going to be locked down for another five, five weeks till 5th of March, it's hard. What's going to happen the 5th of March? Are we going to come back again? Are we, are we going to be locked up? Are we going to be locked down in lockdown again for, till after Easter? Who knows? I just need the, the kids just need something uh, like a light at the end of the tunnel, not just the kids, uh, adults, even when I was playing FC Minewell. Uh, them boys come out and love coming out on a Tuesday and then playing on the Saturday. It's, it's just a bit of relief, uh, release, sorry. They get away from normal life and, and just go out on a Saturday and even go and watch football and uh, live football or play the game itself because everybody loves the game. Uh, that's what, that, that's, uh, it's the biggest sport in the world, uh, football, and uh, it's massive, like, and, it's disappointing to see the championship and uh, and all the leagues in Northern Ireland not, uh, not up and running again. But I understand why they're not up and running. But we still have to worry about the, the mental side of it as well, Michael. That's the big the big thing, what's going to happen for the next two or three or four years. Uh, the, 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 the mental side of it as well is a big, big thing for people. You've had such a, a busy and, and hectic career. You've never really been able to hit a pause button. What What's all this been like for you? How have you not gone demented? No, it was. Uh, that's what uh, got me two weeks ago. I was like, it did hit me. This, uh, once they came out and said we're standing uh, the lockdown, it got me. Trust me, I'm not going to hide the fact it did get me because I just, I just I came here, I can't wait to get out again, can't wait to get out and, as I said before, coach the kids. And once they came out and said that, oh, that's it. You're locked, out, you're locked down and you can't do nothing. No, nobody says anything else. Come here, you can do this, you can do that. They don't know why we can't do one-on-one coaching outside with goalkeepers or even one-on-one outside with uh, uh, outfield players because you're fresh air. Yeah, goalkeepers can coach at least six or seven yards away from the keeper anyhow, you know what I mean? But, uh, Kimi, you have to you have to, you have have to, to go by the rules and stick by the rules and hopefully this pandemic will go away as quick as possible with this vaccine coming out now and hopefully that will help in the, in the future. Yeah, yeah. Um... You know, you said it, it did affect you. What advice would you have to anybody feeling that at the moment? Because I think a lot of, you know, friends and colleagues, people I've spoken to have said the same thing. This time it just feels a wee bit harder. Kimi, Mike, I tell you the truth. Uh, I could turn around and say, be positive and stay strong. Uh, Kimi, I, I was saying that to myself. And, and once I, this lock uh, extended, uh, I had, I for a couple of days, I was just sitting in the house thinking, what can I do? And uh, I was lucky enough, as I said before, at the start of this, was uh, I could go back to elite football and Don Gannon gave me the opportunity. What does other people got got the chance to do? Yeah, I don't know. And yeah. and and I really, really, really worry. And, and I I I uh, hope the government can help these people out as much as they can, and uh, and and understand like this is going to be a long, long progress after this is all over, with the mental health side of it. Yeah, maybe just trying to get into whatever you're passionate about. Find a hobby, find something to occupy your time for you. Obviously, it was getting back to football, but just you need to get in the routine. You need to get in the routine. Yeah, uh, wake up, wake up at eight o'clock, nine o'clock. Go for a walk. Keep your head, uh, keep your head active, and get out as much as you can. I know the weather's not the best <laughs> down here in Fermanagh at the moment, but come here, uh, it's it's difficult for everyone. And and uh, I I went through this before with my injury at uh, at West Ham. And I went, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle it. And I went through a really bad time. I got really bad depression and, and went on the drink very, very heavily. And that was the wrong way to go down because I was thinking about all the bad things. So try and get good thoughts in your head and keep focusing on, on, on what you've got around you and your family as well around you who, who love you and, and want you to be well and keep working hard at it. And in all those things, Roy, that is one of your great success stories and nearly uh, I didn't think I was going to say this at the start of the interview nearly forget about everything you've achieved as a footballer everything you've been through personally and you've in, in recent years spoken about publicly everything that you've come through to, to be where you are now helping other people I think that's just tremendous 
I, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not, like I always say this lucky, I'm a lucky guy to, to get out the other end, like, and, and then now I know, understand, like, and I want to help people out there. When I first came home from, uh, from uh, England, uh, from Notts County, I didn't realise how uh, serious uh, the suicide rates in Northern Ireland, and I, I just wanted to sit down and say, come here, big Pat McGinn and I used to play with at Wigan, he, he's in uh, Lurgan, um, and he, he was doing mental awareness and I wanted to help and talk about my problems, what I went through. And uh, I just hope people can see what I've went through and say, come here, that, that guy's went through it. Why can we not come out and speak about it? And don't be shy to come out and speak about it. But I do understand. I never came out about it for a long, long time until I uh, basically got myself better afterwards. And uh, because I was more worried about what other people thought, but now I don't care what other people thought, think because I just want people to understand. Like if I can help one person, out of, out of 10, 15 people, I'd be over the moon. And that that's what life's all about, is helping people. And uh, that's what I went through. And that's why people said to me, "Do you, what would you do if you had the chance to go back? And I said, I would never change my life because it's made me the person I am. Yeah, yeah. And you seem to be in a brilliant place now, um, which is testament to you, but it, it's lovely to see. So you've, you've had that, that's been your story and you can't change it. No, yeah, come here. Uh, I'm not saying it's always rosy, but you always have uh, some dark, some some bad days. Uh, depression's with you for your whole life, and mm-hmm. it's the way you work with it. And uh, I've been off the drink for ten years, which is uh, I'm, I'm, I feel a lot better. Like with, without drinking, people said that you ever look at uh, going back having a few drinks. And I said no, I'm an alcoholic, and just straight up, I'm an alcoholic. I can't have, even have a have a a, a mouthful of uh, alcohol, and. Uh, and that's the way I am now. I'm more upfront and tell the people the truth. And, and I think that's what people would like uh, out of people, just the truth and, and listen. And that's, I learned that from Sir Alex. Uh, he was the man who tells you the truth. And, and you listen to him as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, here, if we could all be a bit more honest with each other, we'd have a far more civil society. There's definitely something in that. And you look at mm. now being able to throw yourself around in those swamp-like penalty areas well into your 40s. There's obviously something to be said for uh, how healthy your body is. I, I can't even get a haircut as well because the uh, hair, hairdressers <laughs> are all closed down. So I, I don't know. I might go for a skinhead, but no, Kimia. It's as I said before. Like uh, I'm like a big kid now, enjoying football. And uh, but it's the two days afterwards after the game. I'm still a bit stiff today. Like and that's like uh, you know, it's three days after the game. But Kimia, uh, it's just nice to get out playing and you forget about the old stiffness after the game and you just love love getting out. But the good thing about it is like if you win, it's even better. Yeah. And it was nice to win the first game and we've got many, many games to come so I'm not going to get too carried away yet. I thought you were going for the, the Ronaldo look, remember when he was first playing with you? <laughs> uh, I don't know what I'm going for, to tell you the truth. It's just, uh, it's just sitting there. I might just get a uh, machine and just shave it all off, i tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> give, give Chris and the boys a wee surprise the next time you see them. I know. I scare them enough. Eh? I don't think I should come in with a skin head. Like. <laughs> <laughs> you always seem, though, that you really enjoy yourself, Roy, when you're in and around uh, football, because I, I certainly think, you know, after matches, when everyone's going through the different emotions, you always just seem to be a, a smile on your face. Obviously, maybe not if the result hasn't gone your way, but that's uh, fair. I was gonna, fair uh, that's what I was going to say. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll be honest. Like, But, but um, you know, you, you always seem to be very relaxed and enjoy it. Is that is that just because you're grateful to still be playing, or was that is that a, how you've always been? Have that bit of a smile and a joke. Uh, I think I think I had it before uh, when I was at Hull City in Wigan uh, and Manchester United. But uh, when things at West Ham started getting on my shoulders and the depression and the alcohol, I think I was uh, carrying the world on my shoulders instead mm-hmm. of being what I used to be like, just enjoying life and and, and uh, having a smile on my face. But I got that back in Olympiagos when I'm sorry. I moved to Crete first, a team called Offie, and I, and I got that back in Offie. Then I got a move, a big move to Olympiagos. And came here, I look back in my life and I said, Come here, for four and a half years, I was in a bad, bad place, and I don't want to go back to that place. And uh, I just love, love the game, always loved the game. And I just lost love, love of football for nearly four years, over four and a half years. And it's just lovely to get it back. And I'm, uh, I'm back at it again at 43 years old. and. Uh, uh, playing for Dungannon it doesn't matter what team you're playing for I just love getting my, my gloves and my boots back on and playing football but it is nice to win it does help when you have a win and you can <laughs> smile <laughs> well here if the Irish Cup gets back that could be an, another wee medal for you there you never know 
Kim, I don't know. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen to you. Uh, don't know what whether the IFA or the NFL is going to work the, the Irish Cup because I can't see the championships playing because it's not fair to them to play. Uh, they haven't trained all season. They haven't uh, played much games all season. So I don't think that's quite fair. So I don't know if they're going to scrap the Irish uh, Cup or just play the Premier League boys. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. Wait and see. I suppose they're, they're still saying they're going to try and get it done. But uh, Roy, it's been great having you on the score this week. Thank you very much for coming on. And it's, uh, it's brilliant to see you gracing our league once again. Thank you very much, Michael. Great to be back. Cheers, mate.